Hey there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This Book of Mormon Edition. <laughs> I want that to be, I need a drum or a fanfare or trumpets or something, you guys, to get going because we're so excited to start the Book of Mormon. We're sad to say goodbye to the New Testament. I actually feel like those lessons at the end of the Book of Revelation were super awesome. I just, the book ends really well and really hopeful. And then if you didn't see the last episode of um, the New Testament, it just it just left you like loving Jesus so much. It left you wanting another story of Jesus. And as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have one. We have an entire, we have two actually, <laughs> entirely <laughs> new books, different books, additional books, I should say, of scripture, witnesses of the character and the heart and the intentions of God, the Father and the Son. And the Book of Mormon is one of those, and we're studying it this year, and we're super excited to do that. Now, let's lay your groundwork a little bit so that you're just like, okay, here's everything. When we mention something, you know what we're talking about. One is this download that we have. Oh, it's so The Mercies good. of the Lord timeline. You can find this in your newsletter, the link to it. If you don't have a newsletter yet, go to don'tmissthestudy.com, sign up for it, and then it will come and you will have the download. This is a, it has an engineer print, and then which is a 24 by 36 print that you want to do in black and white at any copy shop. You can do this anywhere. If you live in Utah Valley or close in Utah, Pioneer Party has them printed and you can go pick them up. We are going to track because you're also going to print one piece for every single week of the year. And we are tracking the tender mercies of the Lord throughout the Book of Mormon. Nephi says to do that in next week's lesson. Moroni tells you to look back on it on the very last lesson of the year. So those bookends in between, that's what we're looking for. And every week we're going to have one of the mercies of the Lord, which I think is going to turn into a really cool mini little discussion or thought or devotional each week too, because your journals have a spot where you're going to write down the mercies of the Lord that you see in the scriptures, but then also a spot where you can write down the mercies of the Lord that you see in your own story. And you might look, because we're only going to pick one per week. Well, two actually, because <laughs> one goes on here and then our posters are also the dealings of God with his people too. So but Big then there's going to be more. There's going to be more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we want to train our hearts and train our minds. And Nephi is going to teach us to do that next week, to look for the, the goodness of God in our stories. And when you can see it in scripture, it makes it easier to start seeing it in your own. So really excited about that. And it's so cute because one year in my life, I got like an actual paper calendar and my journal that year was, I just wrote like one of the best things that happened to me on every single day of the calendar. And then it was so cute that my calendar was full. And I was just thinking that, isn't it so cute if this just became your calendar for the year? That's that awesome. It's just like, wait, actually look, this is like at the end of the year, it's going to be so cute when it's all filled out. And then there's just going to be moments that you can just look back at the picture and you'll just remember Right. lesson, which right. is so fun. Yes, because it will also serve as a timeline and a reminder of the lessons. We tried to pick a mercy that would be yeah. like almost the most memorable part of that story. So next week, for example, the mercy is that Lehi gets warned in a dream to leave Jerusalem. And so you're like, oh, that, that's cool because it will remind you of the story also. So this is a free download that you can have and um, and use, and I, we really hope you love it. And the pictures end up being so awesome. Look how it's going to look at the end of the year, by the way. Everybody filled out like See, this. it's so cute. Even uh, just seeing that, it makes me so excited. Right, look, the whole book. Ready? And it's Tell so me when pretty. to stop. I'm just going to... Stop. Oh. <laughs> All things as a testimony, Alma, Sermon to Korahor. We just can't wait to get there. There's just so Be many free. good things. Right. <laughs> All right, so this is what, and there are all these watercolored, really pretty pictures that I think you're going to love. So that is, when we talk about the mercy each week, that's what we're talking about when we get there. And then everything else, the poster that you'll hang in your house that reminds you of, again, one of God's promises, one of God's tender mercies, that, the study journal with all the questions and the worksheet, the tippins, and the read it, live it calendar, those you find at Deseret Book. So this guy is a free download you'll find in the newsletter. Everything else you're going to find at Desiree Book. I'll say that right now so that when we mention them and talk about them, you will know. Now, one thing this year that we're doing is we've divided up 
So each week there is a reading of the Book of Mormon to finish the Book of Mormon. 52 segments of the year. 52 weeks to finish the Book of Mormon. This year we read every single page and every single word. In the New Testament, nope, in the Old Testament, remember there's not everything, but I guess every other year you read it. Old Testament's yeah. the only one that's But for different. some reason in my head, <laughs> that was kind of must have been really like impactful because right. in my head I was like, so, oh, finally. You're not, last there's not too. selected readings. You, you and I get to read the whole book cover to cover, which what an awesome goal right at the beginning of the year to say, I want to finish the Book of Mormon again or for the first time this year. So there's 52 segments, but what we're doing is we've divided up it by day. So in the video, what we'll do is we will have six segments and each segment is sort of your Monday reading, your Tuesday reading, your Wednesday reading, your Thursday reading, all, and then our sixth one will be your weekend reading. <laughs> so we'll have six segments. We know that a lot of people like to sit down and have an institute or seminary class once a week, which we think is fantastic. Open up your scriptures. We're going to be really deliberate about which words to circle, what you might underline, cross-references, things like that. And that is fantastic. And it'll work to sit down and just have your weekly lesson with your iPad or computer or whatever, right down on your desk. We also know there's a lot of you who listen to this in the car or on a run or on an errand or while you're folding laundry or driving to school or whatever that may be. And so if that's the case and you only have time for just like a 10 minute per day or something, th that's what your, read your reading will match up with that segment of the day. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes. And it, I think the easiest way to realize it, that's why I love these little read it, live it, is because every single day it shows you your reading. So you can just put it on your desk and know exactly where to go. Yeah, this read it, live it calendar that you can get a Desert Book yes. follows that schedule. It's There's like separated day by day. Day by day. And then it'll tell you one call out verse and one challenge or something that you might do, which we'll get into in the introduction when it says, when you abide by the precepts of this book, this calendar is sort of the precepts calendar, I guess oh, is cute. what we could call it. Okay. Is that a good, like lay the ground? So you're just like, all right, now I see everything that they are doing. We wanted to be a little bit more deliberate in, in this year and having you sit down with us and just, this is almost how we read the scriptures. Yeah. As, as we move through. And I love that it's like, it's not just a one time thing. That's what I'm so excited about this year is that I feel like it's the book of Mormon and Jesus sprinkled in every aspect of my life. You know, that's awesome. Which is exciting. Okay. I'm starting our little cat timer, everybody, in case you're just <laughs> wondering why I left. <laughs> He's done. Grace He's like, did not bye. offend me. All right. Today's lesson is called Another Story of Jesus. We are getting into the introduction pages of the Book of Mormon. So, segment one is called Unto All, and we're looking at the title page. Now, um, when Emily, Emily just recently went to Africa, and she posted this on her Instagram, maybe you read this story, but I loved it, that she met this man, and she actually sent me the story before she posted on Instagram, because she said, you are going to die over this. She <laughs> met this man who was a coconut chopper, <laughs> and he made coconut drinks for everybody. That's and why you loved she, it. <laughs> I did love it for that reason. She showed, um, she met him, and she saw that he had this weathered and worn copy of the Bible with him at his workplace, which I think is fantastic, by the way, that he takes his Bible to work with oh, him. Oh, so true. And so there it is at his work. And she sees it and says, oh, you love the scriptures. And he says, yes. And then she said, I do too. And then she asked him, what is your favorite story in the Bible? And his response was God's. And when she told me that story, I loved thinking about the fact that we might ask that about the Bible or the Book of Mormon. What's your favorite story of the Book of Mormon. And you might say, I love the stripling warriors. Or you might say, I love Abinadi. Or I love Samuel the Lamanite on the wall. Or I love Abish when she runs from house to house. Or I love that man that nobody knows his story, but we're obsessed with him from Helaman chapter five, the guy in the prison, remember, <laughs> who's so awesome. <laughs> and nobody even knows him. And why is he not our hero? You might list off stories that you love from scripture. I love what the coconut man taught us that the scriptures are actually a story about God. And we can watch him and his dealings and his workings with the people throughout the whole book. And I want to issue a challenge at the very beginning of this year as we study the Book of Mormon. Look for what you learn about the Lord in each day of reading. Be deliberate 
about his promises, about his character, about where he is showing up in the story. I love thinking about having the courage of Nephi, but I want to think more about the giver of that courage. And I want to make my reading and my study of the Book of Mormon a worshipful experience. And I think that is one way to do that. You, I feel like you taught me that probably clear back when I was in seminary. And I think that for real is one of the reasons that I love the scripture so much is because he taught me to, instead of look for like uh, tons of heroes, look for one, Mm. him. And once you read scriptures like that, it is magic. And there's the other things that we will talk about following the precepts and learning those things, but. And they should be your heroes. Like they are great. Like you should love them. hundred percent. But let's, let's read God's story this year through the Book of Mormon. It'll change the whole book. Now, this title page is interesting. You might want to know that the history of this is this was a translated page. It was in the plates. And Joseph actually tells you where in the plates it is in his teachings. And it is written, most people think that Moroni wrote this here right before he buries it. It's interesting because he's in the middle of a sentence when he starts off. Wherefore, (laughs) who starts? uh, Wherefore. What happened first? Yeah. And that's a word I looked up, which is the reason why. P.S. Side note, I like have online, you can look up the 1828 version of the Webster's Dictionary. It's nice to know what words meant in Joseph's day. So when he uses them as part of the translation, it's just interesting to look those words up and say, oh, what did they mean in his time period? Because words can change over time. So it's nice to see like, oh, what, you know, the Lord would have inspired him to use a word that he was familiar with. So what word was that? And what was the vibe of that word? So I love having an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. You can get on your online to look up words. And wherefore means the reason for. And it seems like this page is Moroni before he buries the plates is going to say, this is the reason for this book. It's the reason we all gave what we gave and did what we did. Um, So here's sort of the WWW, whatever, the what, how, (laughs) who, everything here. What is this? It says, wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites. I I have highlighted abridgment because I like that he will zoom in to specific people's stories. But at the end of this year, you will have covered a thousand years of history, a thousand years of God's workings. And sometimes it's good to zoom out and see God is in the long game. And that's a value of finishing the whole book because you just, you will at the end of the year say, I watched what he does over a thousand years. And then I zoomed in for a couple of stories, but it's just good to get that bigger, grander perspective as we study scripture. He says to whom, how, oh, first (laughs) I want to say how. As you go through, he says, it's written to the Lamanites who are, rem- who are a remnant of the house of Israel and also to the Jew and Gentile. I'll come back to that. It's written by way of commandment. It's also by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. It was written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord that they might not be destroyed. That's why it was put in the ground. To come forth by the power, by the gift and the power of God unto the interpretation thereof. And I just love highlighting some of those words, gift, power, prophecy, revelation. Even commandment is so interesting. God thought something was really important there. And they said, this is not our idea, it's his. This book is his idea. And what's in it is is his. I also have in that paragraph, to come forth in due time, that phrase underlined. I just love having that perspective. That God said, this will come forth in due time. The promises he's made to you, the prophecies he's made to you and to the world will come forth in due time. In the time that they need to. In the time that's right. In the time that's most fitting. It was buried in 400 AD. It was not needed until 1830. And I think there's something important to remember about that as we get into this book about This is how God works with us. We're learning some things right off the bat about God that are important. One other thing we learn about him is to whom. It's interesting, he says, to the Lamanites and also to the Jew and Gentile. The phrase to Jew and Gentile is Book of Mormon code language for everybody. You're going to see that throughout the book. And just that's code language for the whole world. So it's interesting that he says to the Lamanites and to the Jew and Gentile. To the Lamanites... 
and to everybody. It would be like me today saying like, this book is for the French and everybody else. <laughs> and you're like, why? <laughs> why an emphasis there? And it makes you stop and say, why did you emphasize the Lamanites? If you don't know the Book of Mormon, let me tell you that Moroni, who's going to seal this up, has been running from them for the past 20 years. His father was killed by Lamanites. They are the enemies to these people. They have a predator prey relationship with each other. So for him to specifically call out that this is a book for my enemies is shows how wide the arms of God are, how intent he is on saving every one of his children. He's, you might say like God loves the whole world and I could call out. What about those people that cause havoc and terror? Are they included also? And from, we haven't even started page one. It's the title page and it says all of them, everyone from the very beginning. Which is cool because it almost wants you to fill in the blank. No matter who you are or what you've done, this book was actually written to you. Yes. And the love of God and the gifts of God and the invitations of God are for you. The God that you meet in this book. It's what it's, yeah, it's because it's what it's actually about. Yeah. Oh, cool. Also, he says, an abridgment taken from the book of Ether, Ether also, because that's another thousand year history that's going to be squished down to 15 chapters. So you'll get 2,000 year histories, you know, and, and it's great to just track God over the long game. And he says this, which is to show, and here's the, sorry, here's the why for the book. Three things, and this is, you can fill these in in your journal right here. One, the great things that God has done for their fathers. He says, I want to show you how good and how great God's been. Because if you see it there, you can anticipate it in your story. Second, that you may know the covenants of the Lord, particularly the one that says you are not cast off forever. That God promised from the very beginning, I will keep reaching out. I will not give up on you. Spoiler alert, if you've never read this book, it ends in a disaster. It's a terrible ending. You feel like the whole thing is a failure. So the very existence of this record is evidence that God's not done. He should have br brushed his hands of everybody there, but instead he said, we're going to take a pause and I'm going to come back and work again. And so the very fact the book exists is evidence that God is not giving up on the Lamanites, on anybody. That's reason number two. And the number three that we normally talk about is to convince the Jew and Gentile or the whole world that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the eternal God, and maybe particularly this, that he manifests himself unto all nations. The existence of the Book of Mormon also shows that, that God is working among all peoples in all time periods everywhere. This, is, this book is just one more just piece of evidence of how big and how involved God is in the whole wide world. Beautiful. So there's the title page and it ends with, if there are any faults, there are, sorry. Don't condemn, condemn in 1828 meant to to declare is completely false and unneeded and unusable. And he says, if there's any mistakes in here, don't throw out the whole gift of God. Um, they were probably ours. And it's just a general, I think, advice from the Lord. Don't throw out the gifts because they, their intention is that you might be found spotless and home one day. That's mm -hmm. how that title page ends. So, The cutest end ever. I'm putting my... This little tip in is actually the second one in your package. I'm putting it on the page right after this. So on the contents page, this just pretty much goes through and it has like a little time frame of everything. I'm putting mine right there just in case you want to put it in the and same One thing box. you might want to know about this that's cool is it shows the timeline of the Book of Mormon and then the timeline of the Bible and how they correspond with each other. This is one thing that was so helpful for me as a missionary and I'm teaching Jack. People need to know when you jump into the Book of Mormon, oh, this is where you are in the Bible to give you a frame it's of not reference out of nowhere. for right, where we are and, and what's kind of happening. So this is great, probably next to your table of contents. Yes. It's the second tip in, but it seems to be um, go really well right there. Remember these tip ins? Turn your Book of Mormon into a study Book of Mormon. That's what their intention is. So that's one that you might want to place right there. Which is so exciting. 
<laughs> and should we do this one too yeah. right here? You guys, I'm glad that we put that up there. Let's tell we'll you what, applause. I know we both right. Like, oh, we forgot. <laughs> I was mentioned at the beginning. Uh, if you're listening and you have no idea what just happened, we just showed up on the screen a picture of the very first um, timeline piece that you'll put on, which is called Another Testament. And that is one of the mercies of the Lord is that he's not done, that he has more witnesses, that he has more to say, that there's more stories, that there's more things that you don't even know are happening that he is involved in. And so for the introduction pages, we want to put that tip in on there. I mean, not tip in that piece onto the timeline to say, we believe in a God who um, just has, is, is never, ever done. So that's what oh, you're going to put for week one. That is the cutest line ever. Hurry. Um, the next section is called God's dealings. And I, this is because I have FOMO deeply in my heart. Like I just hate missing out on things, but it's funny that this is happening right after the new Testament, because anytime I read the new Testament, I feel so jealous that I'm like, these people got to be Jesus's next door neighbor and go on walks mm -hmm. with him and take boat rides. And I'm like, they were so spoiled. That's the life that I wanted to choose to live. <laughs> like I got, <laughs> that is sad. I missed out on that. And I love that the introduction to the Book of Mormon almost wants to speak to people that didn't get to be next door neighbors with Jesus. Mm. The ones that didn't actually get to walk physically with him in the streets. And it starts out and it says, the Book of Mormon is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible, but this part wins me. It is a record of God's dealings with ancient inhabitants, inhabitants of the Americas and contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. This is actually what God was doing with people that didn't get to walk next to Jesus. Mm. If you wondered if God forgot about you because you didn't actually get to take walks and go on boat rides with the savior of the world, this book for the majority of it is actually people that didn't live on the same continent as Jesus and God still met them in their lives. No one can finish this book and not say that God's not the major main character of the entire thing. He is as close here as he is in John chapter seven. And that's awesome that it, it's almost subtly reminds anybody that God has dealings with you and is, has, is close with you no matter what place or time period you live in. And it's cool because if you keep going in the introduction, it's going to like, it's gonna win you over on that more and more and more the deeper you read because the next paragraph is gonna go through and it's actually just gonna explain. Let me tell you where we're at. Like, let me give you the geography. It kind of, we already had that on the title page and it's gonna say there's gonna be two civilizations. There's gonna be all these people, da, 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 da. You can read that if you really love history, that's great. Um, but the part that happens after is he's gonna give you a spoiler alert to like the best part. He's like, listen, let <laughs> me tell you what is the key part of the Book of Mormon. The crowning event recorded in the Book of Mormon is the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the Nephites. You remember those people that lived on an entirely different continent? Jesus didn't forget about them. Hmm. You see him throughout the entire story, but he actually shows up for them. That's the key part of this story. And then it's going to get even cuter because it says soon after his resurrection. He didn't wait to see them. They weren't second best to him. He hurried. He didn't forget about these people. And there's just something so beautiful about the fact that it's the personal ministry of Jesus. Mm. That he says, no, this is a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. You're gonna see that when we get to 3 Nephi 11, but he didn't want you to forget right here. It's not that Jesus just came over to like prove it. Like, oh, hey, like I'm here too. Like it was like, no, actually I have seen God work with you for the last a thousand years and I am not going to forget about a single one of you. Mm. It's a personal, this book is about a personal relationship with him. Yeah. Um, and I think on every page. Yeah. That's what that you were teaching in that first paragraph is just, he really will come among them and they will feel the prince in his hands and in his feet and he will be there in 3 Nephi 11 through the end in person. But, but he, man, but there is a personal ministry of Jesus on every page of this book and on every page of, of mine as well. Which is so cool because that's actually where the introduction goes. Mm. He says, listen, 
I'm going to already God's on every single page. Jesus is going to have a personal experience with the people in 3rd Nephi 11. But look what happens after, because then he's going to explain, here's how we got the book. We're going to dive into this in the next like witnesses and testimony of Joseph Smith. But he's like, Joseph Smith got the plates. He started translating them. This is going to be a new in like, this is paragraph four, a new and additional witness that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that all who will come unto him and obey the laws and ordinances of his gospel may be saved. This is a book for every single person. This isn't just about the people, the Nephites and the Lehites. And it, yeah, <laughs> what's <laughs> happening in my head? I don't know. But the Lamanites, it's the thing about it is it's actually for every single person. And what happens after is there's this quote by Joseph Smith that is the invitation to not just reading the Book of Mormon, but actually living it. Mm. And what he says is, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And this part, oh my heavens. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. This book is evidence that God doesn't forget anyone. And if you doubt it, Actually, just try what Joseph Smith said. Hmm. You will get nearer to God by this book than any other book. If you wonder why, maybe it's because every single page on this book is proof that God works on a personal level. Hmm. He's going to show that. There's this most tender quote. Okay, wait, I'm going in backwards order in case you're watching this. I'm not skipping this. I'm coming back. Um, because what's going to happen, this quote by President Nelson is so tender about the Book of Mormon. It says, the truths of the Book of Mormon have the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. If you wonder what being near to God feels like, if you wonder how He gets nearer to you, He gets near to you by healing, by comfort, by restoration, by running to you, by strengthening you, by consulting you, by cheering you on. That's what it looks like to live near to God. And that's actually the word for this week is nearer. And um, it comes from that quote by Joseph Smith, but the translation in the 1828 dictionary wins you because this part is just speaks to my soul, not far distant in place, time or degree. Because I bet that the people that lived in the ancient Americas might have felt like distance was keeping them from their savior. When in reality- Or time, they lived 600 years yeah. away. Or place? place, eventually they're gonna start talking like this in the book. Uh, some place called Jerusalem, because only one group's gonna go on the boat. Even and then they're gonna it. tell their kids and then that's it. And then it's yeah. over. And so the place might as well be the moon of where Jesus is gonna be born 600 years in the future. And so- all three of those. Just is so applicable in the sense that actually from page one, it's proof that God could be near to you even if place, time, distance, degree feels like it's separating you. And I think that's a powerful moment that he's like, no, actually you can still be near to that God. This book is evidence of it. This book is going to show you how. I like that there's so many promises throughout this introduction that someone might highlight or mark. The third paragraph down, what if the question is, tell me how to gain peace in this life. Tell me how to live a life of eternal salvation. Tell me how to get near to God. I feel distant. It's, it's, it's an invitation. This book is, the introduction is teaching you and promising you that this book will show you how. That quote is really what inspired our Read It, Live It calendar to say every day, what, what's, what's a precept that I can apply? What's something that I can, that I've learned from these pages that I can live out and draw near? I, I mean, we can, we can take that promise to the test. We can test it this year. And the thing that I think is so beautiful is that I don't know where any of you are, but there are moments in my life that God feels really distant. And it's so powerful to me that that's the beginning part. He says, actually, you can become near to God this year. What if that was the theme of your year? That you actually can spend all year getting near to him. And then immediately after he says like, actually, let me invite you into this way of living. What if you actually read this book? What if you pondered it in your heart and the message? And then what if you asked God if this was real? What if you spent your year actually getting near to him, 
figuring this out? What if you lived this invitation? And what if you pursued this course is the line right after that. Isn't that awesome? So good. Like such a great like invitation into 2024. Pursue this course. And then it's so tender because it's almost as if right after he's like, if you're wondering if it's worth it, let me give you a promise of what the end of your year will look like. It doesn't have to take the whole year, but by the end of the year, it's almost like he's like, listen, if you do this, if you live this, if you experience this book, those who gain this divine witness from the Holy Spirit will also come to know. And he's going to give you a list, but it almost makes me want to do like a dot, dot, dot. Mm. Because what's going to happen is our journal page this year is kind of built this off week? of, oh yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> it's fine. You can use it all year, everyone. This week, the journal is, if the Book of Mormon is true, then what else is? And maybe you want to go through and you want to start thinking, what does this book teach me? And if this book is real, what does it tell me about God? What is actually true? Even from this introduction, if this book is true, that means that God is with me no matter how far distance, distant he seems. Mm. If this book is true, that means that Jesus actually wants to save me. If this book is true, forgiveness is real. Temples have power if this book is real. And all of a sudden, it just like makes you want to start thinking, what actually could be true if this book is? And maybe you're in a place in your life right now that you're not sure that you're going to take this invitation for the very first time and say, oh, is this actually real? Or maybe you're going to take this invitation for the hundredth time or the third or however many. And maybe it'd be cool on this worksheet to write some things almost as like a wonder. Like, okay, I wonder, like, does God forgive me? Because if this book is true, then that means he does. And maybe use this as like a, here's what I wonder if is actually going to be true mm. this year. Because mm. it could be cool in six months to look back and discover what you've learned and what you wondered about on day one. Yeah, yeah. And I, we want to push you a little bit with this worksheet. And the, that opening paragraph says that Joseph Smith is his revelator and prophet in the last days. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom once again established on the earth. We want to push you one step further than that to say, what did what was restored through Joseph then that I would care about? I, I'm, I'm not as interested in he's a true prophet as what were his prophecies? What were the, the teachings that he gave? And that's where we took it one step further. What were the claims of the scriptures themselves? They're, they're stories of forgiveness. They're stories of revelation. They're stories. That means temples were restored through Joseph. I just want to say a temple's true, but they can become places of refuge. They, be, they can become places of power. They can become greater access to His grace. Like, just go one step further to think, all right, if, if Joseph is a revelator, what did he reveal? If, if Jesus is the Christ, what's that actually mean? Because almost once you start writing down the things that actually matter to you, it's almost as if it becomes more powerful. Mm -hmm. That it's like, oh, wait, actually, I really do care to know that this book is true because I want that to be true. Right. You right. Know? Okay, segment three is the testimonies of the witnesses. We have two of them. We have the testimonies of the three witnesses and testimonies of the eight witnesses. And these are printed in every single copy of the Book of Mormon. If you are unfamiliar with the story, um, after the book was translated, Joseph is going to return the plates he digs them up from the ground, which we're going to read that story next. They should have put the witnesses after the story of Joseph Smith, so you knew what happened. Yeah, and true, for so yeah. many reasons. It's fine, you guys, it's fine. It's going to be fine. But we're good. if you don't know the story, you're about to learn it. But he pulled, Moroni buries these plates in 400 AD. Joseph Smith unburies them in the 1820s. And then he's going to translate from this ancient record then he's going to return the plates to the angel who shows them where they are. And they're not in a museum. They're not on display. They're nowhere for somebody to see. So knowing that this generation is sort of going to be an unbelieving one, <laughs> the Lord provided 11 plus additional witnesses so that we would have someone's story we could rely on. There's something about having an eyewitness 
that initiates or triggers faith in everyone else. Someone has to be an eyewitness, I think, for faith to be perpetuated. It's based off of someone's story, someone's witness. Even the resurrection of Jesus itself, we don't, that's just not like a blind truth written in a book. It's someone's story. It's Mary's. It's Peter's. It's Thomas who said, I saw him and I felt his hands. I was in his embrace. We, we, we saw the stone rolled and we saw it empty and we saw him again. We believe the witnesses of other people. We believe the witnesses. We believe their stories. Is That's where faith grows. And so God provided such a thing for this important book as well because of what it teaches, because of the implications of it. And so you have three witnesses and their names are there. And then you have eight witnesses. Now, the three witnesses in their story, it begins, both of them actually begin like this, be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come. Can we keep in mind that this was written in 1830 <laughs> in upstate New York in a farm country? It is almost preposterous that they would write, dear world, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people unto whom this work shall come. Do you think they ever could have imagined that it would be translated into Japanese? Did they even know about Japan? <laughs> what about <laughs> Ukraine? And what about Uruguay, right? To think that they had an, a, a feeling of, of how big this work was going to be, that that's who they addressed their witness to. Not to the ci dear citizens of Palmyra, New York, but they addressed their witness to the world. They had a sense of where this was going. Well, and you might be talking about this in just a second, but David just told me that he just like reminded me of all their ages of the three witnesses. And Oliver and David were 23 and Martin was 45. And there is something to be said about what was the conversation when they wrote that down? Because it's almost like, yeah, you could like relatively convince a 23 year old of anything. It feels like in my head, I'm 24. So I could say that I have grounds to say that. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that will be good. That sounds really good. Let's write that to begin with. <laughs> but there's something so cool to me that, oh, actually there's a 45 year old and a 23 year old that were on the same page about something like that. Yeah. And I'm almost 45. Well, I have a couple of years, but I'm getting there. I'm closer to 45 than you. So it's kind of fun. We're the ages yeah. of the witnesses. And it's like, can you believe that he chose two 23-year-olds? Right. Well, that he like, was that age too. Yeah, it's so true. We have I'm to like, remember as we read about this story, it's grace. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Everyone's like, oh no. And I'm like, so true. So true. It's really interesting to see that. I love some of the other words that they will say that we, through the grace of God, the father, mm. uh, underline that phrase, that the witness will come, that their experience will come as a gift of grace from God, the father and the Lord Jesus. We've seen the plates that contain the record of the Nephites and the Lamanites and their brethren and the people of Jared and the tower. We also know they've been translated by the gift and power of God for his voice declared it unto us. He the originator of this story told us himself. Wherefore, we know of a surety. There's that wherefore word. Why can we say? Because his voice declared it unto us. We also testify, we've seen the engravings, which are upon the plates. We heard a witness, we saw it, and they've been shown unto us by the power of God. And we declare with words of soberness. We know this is not a light thing to, talk, to, 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 to have such a claim. It, and then again, that an angel of God came down from heaven. We know how that sounds, but he brought them and he laid them before our eyes. We saw the plates and the engravings. Again, we know it's by the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that we are able to see and we're able to bear record to us. It is marvelous in our eyes. But... God commanded us that we should bear record of it. And so we will. To be obedient unto the commandments of God, we bear testimony of these things. I thought that this was kind of an interesting um, 
they had this personal witness experience. And I'm starting to like underline in these paragraphs of the three witnesses and the eight witnesses, some of the things I might learn if I'm interested in having my own personal witness. One, that phrase through the grace of God. Two, that his voice will declare it. It makes me want to listen for his voice if I know that. He says, by the things that we've seen and the things that we've been shown, makes me want to look for God's dealings. It makes me understand they're going to be shown to me. I like that the angel, it says, comes down. He came down from heaven. That witnesses come from a divine place. They come from heaven. They come down to us. Well, and that there was an angel. Yeah. Like, I love the idea that it's like, oh, no, actually, let me give you someone else, too. Well, and it makes me think, too, when you just said that, that each of us have an angel who's introduced us. Exactly. To divine things. We each could put a name to that. Theirs was Moroni. But someone's brought that testimony and witness to you. And someone's brought it to me. We each have an angel in our story who's done that. Before. But their words, all of a sudden, you're like, oh, wait, actually, this... This is changing the way I'm believing. Yeah. Eight witnesses, they're a little bit different in that they actually get to hold the plates, it says. Um, he says, again, to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, whoever this work will go to. Joseph Smith showed us the plates. They had the appearance of gold. We did handle them with our hands. We saw the engravings. Um, we bear record with words of soberness that we have seen and hefted and know of a surety that Joseph has gotten the plates. I love this question that's in the journal. These questions are for just self-reflection throughout the week. But it just says that um, we study the accounts of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Could you add your name as a witness of this book? And what would you write? I'm curious what you've seen. Have you hefted the truths of the book? Have you abided by the precepts and what has come from that? I just feel like these people I know physically held the plates and physically saw them. But the pattern of becoming a witness is a pattern we can still learn from without, although I can physically heft the book, I can carry it around. I can open up the pages. They didn't just drop here. They, they exist. The words are actually here to read. Before Joseph, they did not exist, right? These were, this was, these were blank pages. <laughs> they were blank. And so we do have somewhat a physical evidence. It's sitting right in front of you, you know, to be able to. It's like you can't believe it right now. You're well, it, it is true, right? I mean, they just, I've written a thing or two before and stood at a blank page on a computer screen and, you're like, and know how daunting that is. And so for these words to actually exist, the stories to be here, this, so there is some overlap there with us engaging with what is there. I, I was looking at some of the three and eight witnesses, and I thought you just might love to know this. The Christian Whitmer of the eight witnesses was a, a law enforcement. He was a cop. And, and Jacob was a shoemaker. And Peter Whitmer was a tailor. And John was a farmer, and Hiram Page was a doctor. And Joseph Smith Sr. was a school teacher, but a dad. And Hiram was an older brother, and Samuel was a younger brother. I loved looking up each of their professions, and it just opened up that door for any and all of us to become a witness. Each of us, whatever our profession, whatever our relationship, whatever it may be, can become a witness to this book. We can say with a surety, after abiding by one of these precepts, I got nearer to God. We can be a witness of that quote from President Nelson. I was healed. I, I was strengthened. I, was, I, I felt him run to me. I, whatever, all, I can't remember what all of them were, but we can become a witness of each of those things and, and their invitation, their witness, their testimony just leaves space for us. Something I've done in my book that you might want to do in yours, and maybe you'll wait till the end of the year, or maybe you could do it right now, is I really did sign my name underneath their witnesses as well. I just, David Butler, I wrote it right there as one more of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are. Mm -hmm. He still wants your witness. Your witness matters. It's fine. Makes you could a just be a farmer. Yeah. It's a great. farmer turned angel for somebody else. Oh, 
That was so precious. <laughs> um, now we're going in reverse to the story. And like all good stories start, this is dark and songs. <laughs> it starts <laughs> on the 21st night of September. You guys, I'm spoiled because that's my birthday. So that's why I'm, my story's good too. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, what happens is the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith is going to pretty much just be in the beginning this story. The testimony is filtered throughout, which I think is a cool lesson on testimony, that his testimony was actually founded on a story. He said, listen, let me tell you an experience. Mm. This is what I had, and that's my testimony, mm -hmm. was my experience. Ooh, that's really, really good. <laughs> Thank you. Know? you. <laughs> because I think everybody's testimony and witness is of an experience. It is of a story. Anybody who stands and at the pulpit and says, or anybody who sits in a living room, or anybody who's in from the passenger seat of the car says, I know, I believe, fill in the blank, has an experience connected with it. They have a story to tell. And the story actually can be the testimony. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, like I, it doesn't need to have additional words. That story, this story for him was enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And what happens is he starts out and he's like, okay, on the night of the 21st of September. <laughs> Do you remember? That is going on the app. As For the, the song worship of the song week. of the week. <laughs> it's good. So there you go. Perfect. Now you're going to love that song. Um, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God. The story starts with a prayer. His mm. testimony started with a prayer. And what happens next is actually in the middle. And can I add middle, in a prayer and a plead? Yeah. A supplication is another way to say a plea. It began with a, I need help. It began with a lack. It began with an ask. And That's even really more cool. tender that after he's saying that, it's to an almighty God. Here's my plea to the God who I know has the power to help. Hmm. That's the start of his story. And what happens is while he's in the middle of this prayer, um, he gets this light into his room. And what's going to happen is an angel is actually going to appear in the middle of Grace, his room. Grace, I am not over that yet. I'm not over <laughs> that. <laughs> I am like in it. You know that like the Book of Mormon came in answer to help. Like that's what initiated. This book came in answer to how old was he? 17? And it's even going to be cuter because of the five, response, whatever. just so Help. you know. Right. The, like, isn't that awesome? This book came in answer to a 17-year-old boy saying, Help. And it's that so cute. That awesome. What did, he know, what did he know about God that made him the one he wanted to ask? Mm. When he needed help, when he was desperate for something, what did he know about God that made him the one he wanted to go to? Yeah. And what happens is an angel is the response initially. And he's going to go through in the first three paragraphs of this testimony and describe the angel. But the thing that I can't help but notice is that this angel, from Joseph's perspective, was divine but not unfamiliar. It was, just a, it was just a human. He could tell instantly that that human was divine, but it wasn't someone unfamiliar. And the evidence to me of that is at the very end when he says, when I first looked upon him, I was afraid, but the fear soon left me. Hmm. It didn't feel scary to him anymore. It felt safe. Hmm. It felt familiar. Hmm. And I love that that's how God is going to answer in something that is divine, but familiar. He says, no, listen, like you're going to feel okay when you see him. It's He's not going to scare you. It almost seems like a promise to me. Just that I, I have that highlighted too. The fear soon left me. It feels like a promise from God that as you, as, as I engage in your story, this is almost the Lord speaking to me. The fear will leave you. It's really cool. Yeah. And what's going to happen next is actually going to be the answer to a little boy's prayer for help. And it makes me wonder if maybe that could be a pattern for our prayers for help too. If maybe God might not answer in a similar way. Because what's going to happen is he actually, the angel calls that boy Joseph by his name. And it makes me think that actually God was calling that boy by his name. And he starts out and he says, listen, Joseph, 
if that angel knew Joseph's name, so did God. Mm. And even more than that, he says, listen, I know that he was sent from his presence to me. And then all of a sudden you're going to get to part two. Part one to his answer for help was actually just that God knew him. If God took the time to learn that boy Joseph's name, then I am sure that he knew what was happening in that boy's life Mm. instantly. He's like, oh, he knows me. He knows my name. I'm safe. This is okay. I think it's, I just, for the first time, thought about the fact that Joseph doesn't know who Moroni is yet. And that would be just like a... <laughs> he's like, his name is Moroni. <laughs> yeah. I'm you like, know? Okay. It's, it means nothing to him yet. It just he's, he's like, like, hi, awesome. I'm Moroni. I say, great. And he's like, he's like uh, we're going to be great friends. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> but... That name means a lot to me. Like, there's a lot of history with that name. There's, but it's interesting that Joseph's like, okay. Okay, bro, right? Yeah, good to Can't meet wait you. to find yeah, out what's going to happen here. Interesting. And then this is part two of God's message. God just using regular people. It's kind of what I was meaning by that. Yeah. You know? It's just like, oh, it, he, he, you didn't, he didn't need to be important to Joseph right. to go. Yeah. Um, that God had a work for me to do. Hmm. That's actually the response to the plea of help. I know you. I have a work for you to do. You do not need to sit here helpless. I have something for you to do. I've already thought this through. Um, And that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations. Instantly, you know that the work he has for little tiny Joseph is not going to be an easy work. Mm -hmm. If people know you for evil, that's an intimidating role to step into. Mm -hmm. That couldn't have been a thrill for Joseph to hear. And then what's going to happen is he's going to explain his job. He's going to say, listen, there's this book. It's hidden. It's written on gold plates. All of this stuff about it. It's the whole gospel is written on this book. It is incredible. And also, not only do you have the book, but there's also going to be two stones in silver bows and these stones fastened to a breastplate. The Urim and Thummim, all of these things. But this is the most important part to me that he says, and this is what I have underlined in that paragraph. And that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. God knows you. God has a work for you. And God will help you. He actually prepared from the very beginning what you will need when you need it. When you need help in this work that's going to feel overwhelming and scary and you feel unqualified for, God already planned your help. Mm. He already said, no, I am in the middle of this with you. I will help you accomplish this work. Mm. I know you. I know what you're going to need. I've got it. Yeah. That's the message. That's the response to help. And it's so interesting to me that after that happens, um, they have like this little tiny conversation and then the angel actually leaves. And it's so interesting because he gets like a little, a little less dim, a little, oh wait, a little more dim, a little more dim, a little more dim until once again, it was left dark. And I think there's a moment for me that, yeah, his room actually got physically darker But to me, sometimes after these conversations with God, it seems that my life gets a little bit darker too. I have these spiritual moments. I have these moments when I realize that God knows me. He has a work for me, that God is helping me. And then it's the moment after Mm. that it's like, oh wait, now the angel's gone. Now the moment is over. And what happens is he actually says, and the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light made its appearance. If you walked into that room, you would have had no idea what happened there the night before. Mm. The evidence was gone. The only person that knew was that boy, Joseph. And I just think it's so interesting, Joseph's response, because I think sometimes we have those moments too. When our life is completely changed, God steps into our story. We have a conversation with him that seems to change everything. And then we step back into our life and we're like, I'm different now. I'm new. I had this moment and no one else around you realizes. Everything goes back to the way it had been before. Yeah, the room was the same. Nothing changed. But the boy was different. Except for Joseph. Mm. And then what he does is so interesting. I lay musing on the singularity of the scene and marveling greatly at what had been told by me. 
everything was different, but that boy couldn't let go of that experience. Mm -hmm. He was going to let that sit on his heart. Mm. The boy that needed help, got a response from a God who knows you, who has a work for you, and a God who will help you. Mm. And even if the world didn't know that, even if everything else went back to normal, that boy could remember that night. Yeah, yeah. We, um, the, on the read it, live it for this page, this first page of the Joseph Smith, I love that just the invitation that we give is to listen for him to call your name. Because... If he knows Joseph and has a work for him and, and is going to help him, that, then that's true for every single one of us. So that's something that's neat. These, by the way, are divided up into three different pages for your reading. Oh, yeah, so so page one was going to be your reading for Thursday. Page two is going to be your reading for Friday. And I'm going to start. Um, we're calling this one again because I want to start where you were just reading and left off at that end of that first page. And, and just some words to maybe highlight as you move through this. I lay musing on the singularity of the scene, marveling greatly at what had been told me. When in the midst of my meditation, just take those words for a second. I mused, I marveled greatly. I was in the midst of meditation, then suddenly discovered the room again began to get lighted. There's so many words I'm highlighting there. The musing, marveling, and meditation as almost a key to light coming again. We, I looked back on my experience and that invited that light to come again. And I circled the word again in my real life scriptures. Here, I have to have it highlighted you know, on my phone. <laughs> right? That God's a God who comes again. That if your experience feels like it's gone dark, it will begin to get lighted. And in an instant, as it were, a heavenly messenger again by your bedside. Just highlight every time you see that again. Highlight what you wish to happen. Heavenly messengers again to be lighted. He commenced and again related the very same things he had done at that first visit. As if Joseph needed a reminder like we all do, of those three truths that Grace taught us. That He knows us, He has a work for us, and He will help us. I don't care if how many times He confirms that truth. I need it again and again and again. I need the reminders of it. And God is a God who reminds. And He's not sad to. He's right? not sad to come again. He's mm -hmm. not sad to come for four times. Right. Another thing he does in that paragraph is after he did that, he informed me of the great judgments which were coming upon the earth. Great desolations by famine, sword and pestilence that would come onto this generation. Um, one of the things that God does is he, he um, warns us. He prophesies of things that the world, just so you know, this is what the world is going to be like. That's one of the things that he does. By this time, so deep were the impressions made on my mind that sleep had fled from my eyes and I lay overwhelmed in astonishment at what I had both seen and heard. There are those words again. Astonishment, impressions on my mind. He's sitting there replaying it. He's sitting there like just letting it settle in. But what was my surprise? <laughs> I love that line. Please underline that because please expect that you have a God who will surprise you. Again, there it is. Again, right? Circle that word. The same messenger at my bedside reminding me of those things. This time adding a caution. Underline that word. We have a God who cautions us. Satan's going to try and tempt you. There's something about calling out a caution, calling out a temptation. I love remember sitting there as Christian and Jack, my boys got their patriarchal blessings and hearing the Lord caution them about things. One of my boys got a pretty direct and distinct caution. Hmm. And I thought, how helpful to know this is, this is what you can expect. Perhaps it's a part of your personality to be drawn to this. And Joseph's to the money because of how poor your family is. This is the temptation that Satan's going to give you. President Benson said about the Book of Mormon, one of the things that the Book of Mormon does really well is it exposes the enemy of Christ. It will almost give us the playbook of the adversary. And he says, and, and teaches him, let me help you how to overcome that temptation. Focus on glorifying God. 
and that will help you overcome that temptation, Joseph. After this third visit, he again ascended into heaven, and I was left again to ponder on the strangeness of what I had just experienced. I love that he uses that word. How odd, how crazy. I'm in a shared (laughs) bedroom with my siblings. I have dirt under my fingernails. I sell maple syrup on the weekend to make ends meet. And God's coming to me. This is so strange. And he's talking about all nations and kindreds and tongues and people that my name will be known by good and evil throughout the whole world. (laughs) This is crazy. This is, whoa. And he's just, and I think this is an invitation to all of us to sit in the musings, sit in the meditation, sit in the wonder, sit in the delight, sit in the surprise of all of these truths that God has promised us and said to us. I would suggest if we, if it's not causing us to muse and marvel and wonder and be surprised, we're limiting God too much. That would be one of the indications I would know that it came from him. If it surprised me, if it caused me to marvel, if it made me think, whoa. And perhaps that's why he needed to come again and again. Um, is, do I go into the part with his dad on the page? My yeah. digital version is not telling me what the page you do. numbers Surprise. are. You do. Good. Oh, so speaking Lucky of surprises. You. Yeah. He will then go to his dad. Remember the next morning. Here's kind of what you were teaching. I got from my bed and as usual, went to the necessary labors of the day. Is that just not the truth? <laughs> you might have this remarkable experience with God and you got to clock in tomorrow at 9.05 a.m. 9.05, you're late. Yeah, you're late. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Right back into work as if nothing changed but you did. And he's so exhausted, his dad notices and says, I need you to go home. And he goes home and then he passes out, quite unconscious of anything he says. And the first thing I can recollect was a name, uh, uh, that same voice calling me by name. Again, that reminder that's there. And told me, go tell your father. And he did. And when I went to my dad, I just love this advice to me as a father. The dad replied to me and said, that is of God. And told me to go and do as was commanded by the messenger. I just love thinking to be a father like that and a friend like that, that when someone comes to have the sense and the discernment to encourage and say it's of God and encourage to go and do what was commanded. So exciting. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, beautiful. Okay, everyone, I'm going to talk about this right now because I'm going to forget if I do it at the end. I love Is that it. Fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first tip in that we're using as the second tip in, I'm telling you this se- the, right this second. I'm going to put after the brief explanation right in the illustrations. I'm telling you because you guys, I don't know why I'm so excited about these. It's because they're so pretty and I'm, I can't wait for my whole scriptures to have these in them. So I'm putting mine right there. I think it fits really good right after the brief explanation. It's just going to show you the structure of the Book of Mormon. It's going to go through. These were the pages that were lost. This is like it's who's in these stories, who's writing these books, all of the important things that you're going to want to know before you dive into the story. I'm putting right before the story starts. So that's just your little Yeah. In. Let me just show it to the camera for those of you watching on YouTube so you can just see. Like and it just is so like cute. where all the plates are and Okay. Um, so what's gonna happen is Joseph now goes to the hill. And it's so interesting because initially when I read this, even for the however many time, like this week when I read it, like almost the first thing I thought is like I was like, that is so hard to believe that for real, that's where the plates were, like next to his house. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm like, you have got to be kidding. And it's interesting that I had this thought, like right when I thought that, that God said, are you going to read this book in the lens of doubt or in the lens of faith? Mm. And right when I heard that instantly, I just thought, God is such a good planner. Mm. And it wasn't that this was, oh my gosh, that's so crazy that that possibly happened. No way, that's hard to believe. Instead, it was actually a God who was that good at planning. And that's how this story at the hill starts. And he goes to the hill exactly where the angel said that it was going to be buried. And he goes and he finds it. He actually really does. um, Well, he 
finds the place. You know what I'm saying. And he goes and he looked in and there indeed did I behold the plates, the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate as stated by the messenger. Exactly what he told me actually was true. The box in which they lay was formed by laying stones together, da, 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 all of these things. And as he reached to take them out, he was actually forbidden by the messenger. And it's so fascinating to me because what is about to happen is he is going to try for four years. He's going to go back every single year to try to get those out. He's Mm -hmm. going to try this over and over and over again. And his answer is this. And I have this underlined that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived. Mm. Joseph spent four years waiting. And sometimes it's confusing when God's going to tell us something and then we are going to have to wait. Joseph is not the only person that has ever had that happen. And maybe you are in the middle of a like waiting place right now that you have this promise, something that your heart is hoping so deeply for. Or that even God has put on your heart. It yeah. might not be, even be your own hope and your own desire. Although God is pretty open and direct about the fact that I want you to have desires of the heart. But this might be a promise he's put on you, spoken to you in word or in whisper. And maybe there's a reason it hasn't quite, uh, what was the phrase you said? The time for bringing it forth had not yet arrived. Yeah. And what's going to happen is he really goes for four years, every single year, he's going to show up at that exact same place and hope that it's finally time. And you learn something about the heart of this boy, because what happens is he's going to give you a clue into his conversation with that messenger every single time. I went at the end of each year and at each time I found the same messenger there and received instruction and intelligence from him at each of our interviews. Mm. He was not angry that the angel said, wait, he actually said, okay, give me some advice in the waiting. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to have to wait for another year, give me all of the instructions that I need. And then this part, oh my goodness, respecting what the Lord was going to do. Hmm. If God is not done working, then I am not done waiting. Mm -hmm. Give it another year. I'll be fine. I will wait as long as God needs me to wait. And then what you said, so, it, but in the meantime, teach me something. What Let, could I I'm, be doing? What, instru- give me some instruction and intelligence of what to do next. Yes. In the waiting. And what's going to happen is finally one day he gets the plates and um, it's the 22nd of September. He goes back there. I love that he goes back on the year. For some reason, it's just so tender to me that he just knew the day he should go. It's his little anniversary. Yeah. He's like, okay, I better go this day again. Um, And he gets warned. He says, don't be careless with this. And it makes me wonder if that's one of the reasons he had to wait. Hmm. Because I think one of the reasons, like... The longer you wait, the more valuable something becomes to you. Yeah. Like it's like Disneyland. If I have to wait for 15 minutes, I'm like, oh, that was a fun ride. If I have to wait an hour and a half, that better be the best ride I've ever been on at Disneyland (laughs) in my life. And I love that maybe that's part of the reason is that I wonder if Joseph was a little bit more careful because he had spent four years waiting and working for that chance. And what happens is he's going to go through. And immediately, for no sooner was it known that I had them, that all of a sudden everything started to fall apart. The persecution became more bitter and severe than before, and multitudes were on the alert continually Mm. to get them from me if possible. That boy went through it. He was not given an easy task. Not only was it hard to get them, but it was hard to keep them. That was his story. He said, Mm -hmm. this is what I just lived through, which instantly to me makes this book a little bit more valuable. Once I think about what that little tiny boy was willing to do to not only get it, but also to keep it. Yeah. That's a testimony to me. Yeah. And what's going to happen is in the end, he says, I delivered these back up. And that is my story. That is my testimony of these plates. That's what happened to me. This is my story, dot, 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 and God's. This Mm. is his story of these plates. And what's going to happen is the next page is just a little brief explanation. And if you love history, you're going to love this page. And if you're me, um, 
you're going to still love it, but not because of all the history, because what's going to happen is it's just going to give you a little reminders. Okay. It's just going to be all these little history things, but the start of the reminder, like what made up the plates and this, yeah. just what the tip in shows yeah. but in picture form. These yeah. are word Instead form, of picture words. form. Yeah. And the star actually is going to tell you the sources from which this record was compiled, including the following, the plates of Nephi, the plates of I already of know Mormon, where you're going to go. The plates so of excited. Ether, I the plates of brass. I already know what you're going to do. And I'm dead for it, Grace. I and this already is the thing know. that I love. This is the thing that I love. Oh my gosh, I already know. Is that there was room in this book for every single one of those people's stories. Mm-hmm. That is actually it. We get all of their plates. And I just think there's something special about this book that that's what it wants you to know. That's what it wants you to think. There's actually room for these people's stories. We need all of their plates. And it makes me think, what if we could have our own? Just add a number five to the bottom of that list and say, the plates of grace. What if that's how we spent this year? Is compiling these plates actually were just people's stories and experiences and moments with God dealing with them. Mm-hmm. God entering, entering into their story. And I don't think that God stops doing that. In fact, the scriptures love to say that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means that God actually still wants to enter into my story. He wants me to write things down. He wants me to have experiences with him. That's, what these, that's the only thing that this book is. People's experiences with God. Mm-hmm. And right when I realized this year was going to be the Book of Mormon year, I decided that that's what I wanted to focus on, was not only their stories, but my stories with God. And so I got this Book of Mormon, and I'm not a painter, but someone that I know and love is. And I had them paint all of my like most tender places that I have experienced God. And like it's like Jerusalem and Argentina, and it's like the seminary building that I first got hired in, and it's like my house and like this kitchen table and a skate park and all of these random experiences and places that actually became a part of my plates. It's these moments that God actually was dealing with me on a personal one-by-one ministry. Mm-hmm. These are my moments. And I decided that I don't just want to have 12 moments. I want this year to be full of them. And so I told David that I was doing this. And then now I'm telling all of you guys, because I can't even wait, is I don't want to forget about that in three months. And I don't want to forget about that in two weeks. And so I decided that my goal is actually to carry this book around with me as much as I possibly can everywhere I go. Because to me, the inside is proof of a God who deals with people on a personal one-on-one experience and memory and life and actually it's just plates full of that and the outside is the evidence that God has done that with me and I want to carry it around so I don't forget that God and me are still writing our story together yeah we're in the middle yeah somehow if it's in you you know your study journal if it's on some other journal that you have keep track of places and experiences that you have with the Lord this year, the tender mercies, look for them in the book, but look for them in your story also. I just think it's awesome that, you know, you could, this is a sacred record, it says, and the sources from which this record was compiled include the following. And we will have a story at the end of our lives. And we will say of that story, this is a sacred record. And the sources from which that record is compiled are the following colon and you could begin to write the places and the experiences that you have kind of like you had on the outside of that book what if we all carried around a book this year to just remind us to do that as we see it sitting next to us in the car if it's in our purse or our bag or our backpack that we could just oh yeah i'm watching for god to show up in my story i'm i'm watching to see his his dealings. I, I want to remember the promises. It could just be a physical reminder of all of those and to keep our hearts in tune and our eyes opened. It, it can remind us to muse and to marvel and, and to be surprised. It's just, there could be something really cool about doing that. And why is this so fun to hold? Like, that's what I was telling David. It just feels so I good in my hands. <laughs> I know, I'm like, it's guys, it's so cute to hold. <laughs> that I just little. can't help but think like, oh, Of course that I like want to have in my hands every single day, the God from these stories. 
And of course, I wanna hold it with me every single day so that everywhere I go, I remember he's actually with me right now. Mm -hmm. And my book could just be my reminder. Yeah, it is a reminder. Nearer to God, and you can physically be nearer yeah. to his story when you carry it around. So maybe you wanna do that for your whole family, like the first week of study, get everyone a, a And copy make it cute, it. you can make it cute, you guys, because look, now I, I seriously can't go anywhere without this. This is my favorite thing I've ever owned. So I'm you like, can put a bye. cover on it, a paint, you could paint it, you could do all so many cool things with it. You know, they can oh, just be awesome. It's We're be so such excited a good this year, year, you guys, to just study along and read more about God's story. Okay, we'll see you for First Nephi next week.